The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. We're good? Yeah. It started. Ready to go? Yes, you're good. Okay. Well, hello, everyone who has joined us for this webinar on building a business case for simulation programs. My name is KT Waxman, and I am the director of the Masters in Healthcare Simulation program at the University of San Francisco. And I'm going to go through building a business case, and then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about our program. And we do have a new cohort starting in January of 2016, accepting applications now. So I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. So for the next 30, 40 minutes, I'm going to talk about um, building a business case. And what I'd like to cover here is um, some of the components of a budget, uh, talk about what return on investment would look like with the SIM program, articulate various metrics used to monitor performance and productivity, and the key components or the key elements of a business plan. I've kind of chunked those out for you. The webinar will provide the participants with an overview of tools needed to help build a business case. Metrics, budgeting, and articulating the return on investment will be discussed. So I want to just start with what is simulation and why do we use it in healthcare and why we're even talking about building a business case. So simulation as defined by the Society for Simulation in Healthcare is the imitation or representation of one act or system by another. And we've been doing simulation for many, many years in healthcare. You know, just think about the orange that we're giving an injection into or starting IVs on one another. So simulation isn't new but it has really been redefined over the last 10 years or so, uh, primarily due to technology and um, simulators that have emerged in uh, various vendors um, around the world. Um, and so I would say that about 10 years ago we were very, very focused on the technology, but right now we need to focus on the methodology. And moving into that, they say that the purpose of simulation are, is there are four main purposes. One is education, and you notice how it says education and not training, because they're really educating uh, healthcare workers in team building, communication, and um, uh, declining, deteriorating patient assessment, etc., rather than training them to do things that they could do on a task trainer. Um, assessment, assessment is. Um, very, very important in both um, nursing and medicine, FMPs, all of our, our entities to do a thorough assessment and simulation is perfect for that. We can create a very uh, safe environment with fidelity that allows the learner to feel that they are in an actual environment to do these um, assessments and learn. Um, it's also used for research. And most recently, one of the hot topics is health systems integration, using simulation uh, as you're building hospitals and wings and um, testing out new equipment in, in different hospitals. It's simulation has a, a large role. So there are several types of simulation. There's computer-based simulation that um, could be very, very basic to very, very high-tech um, like in the gaming industry. High fidelity, and the term high fidelity was really coined to be um, utilized with these high fidelity simulators that breathe and have pulses and bowel sounds and breath sounds and that, when in fact you can create a very high fidelity environment with a standardized patient or a standardized participant as well. So high fidelity, the higher the fidelity, the higher the realism in the room. Low fidelity could be um, a mannequin in a bed that doesn't have all those bells and whistles, and you're really doing a scenario around team building. 
Um, you could have a task trainer that's just an arm or a torso, and that would be um, lower fidelity than, than that full-blown mannequin. Um, standardized participants or standardized patients, also known as SPs, are very high fidelity um, in my mind, and these are people who are hired or volunteer their services to um, act like a real patient, and they're scripted to allow students uh, to ask them questions and examine them. And they can also be used as actors, as a family member, or um, another role in a simulation. Um, hybrid simulation really entails a combination of perhaps high fidelity or task trainer and a standardized participant. So an example would be an uh, OB simulation where you have a actor who is acting like they're in labor and then the birth is being completed with a task trainer or um, a birthing prompt. Um, immersive, we can actually immerse people in a scenario where the adrenaline goes up, it looks like a real thing, and they have to perform in a simulation. In situ or in situ, depending on where you live or where you're from, is actually very popular in the hospital setting where they do codes and or mock codes in the actual room or the gurney or the bassinet and or the lobby. So it actually means um, you know doing the simulation where if the unit or the activity would occur. So a lot of mock uh, simulations, mock codes going on in hospitals. Um, I've seen schools use in situ simulation in perhaps uh, they create a, a, you know, a driveway where the ambulance comes in and they're doing some simulation in the parking lot and then they move them into the simulation center. Um, mobile simulation is also very big, especially for our urban areas, using mobile to go out into the rural areas to educate others and put a mannequin, a couple of educators in a van and move out um, and do that education. And virtual reality like uh, Second Life or even um, the cave where it's like a black box and people go in and, and they have photos from maybe the battlefield and some smoke and some smells and some gunshots and it's actual or holograms and, um, and these things are, are actually very adrenaline provoking and that is a simulation. So many simulation centers are building out um, areas to have all these things on different floors and different rooms and creating an environment in a simulation center that people from their entire um, system can come and utilize and the key is how do you sell this? So it's really not about the technology, it's about the methodology. And many of you may have bought simulators, you have a lot of simulators that you're working with, but we really don't have an actual plan around how we're going to um, make this work, uh, standardize what we do, and so it's very important to have a plan. So you want to build a simulation center or a program. And you notice I'm saying center, not laboratory. That's the term that we're using now as a center. Uh, you could have a center without walls and just have a simulation program. And so you might be the lone duck just waiting to get money to do simulation. You might have a simulator in the emergency department or in the OB and you're doing simulation and then you're locking up the simulator and you're wanting to create a program or um, have that program incorporated into the overall strategy of the system. Or you might have a, a simulation center that was funded by a philanthropist. You were funded um, simulators, uh, but you don't have any budget for faculty development. You don't have a plan. So that's what we're going to talk about, is actually building a business case for simulation. So pretend like you have no, you have a blank slate, and you want to go in and ask for money and build a case for simulation. And it's really a written argument intended to convince a decision maker to approve some kind of action. So you want funding, space, equipment to build a simulation program. So when, when do you need one? Um, an example of when you would need a business case is the development, uh, development of a new service or a program to increase revenue. So revenue is important because 
you may be asked to bring in revenue if you build a simulation center. So that's one way to look at things by outsourcing the space that you have to the community and getting paid for that. But it may not all be about revenue, it may be about cost avoidance and the simulations that you do in your sim center or within your program will enable the hospital or health system to decrease costs and avoid claims and med errors in that. You would also need a business case to develop a program to operate more efficiently. So you might have a couple simulators and now you want to build a program. You want to focus on quality and patient safety and we need to be able to quantify what that means. You cannot just say, well, let's build a sim center and they will come and when they come, we will help them increase quality. Your CFO, Chief Financial Officer, your CEO will say, will explain what you mean by that. How can you explain how to quantify quality? So some of the components of a business case include a, an executive summary. And this is usually something that is written up after you've done your plan. So we're going to talk about the whole business plan. And then after you write it, you'll write a synopsis, a one to two page maximum that includes a concise description of your problem or opportunity and the solution you propose. Now, it's very similar to writing a manuscript for publication. At the end of, you, at the end of writing that manuscript, that's when you write your abstract. So you want to describe the present situation, identification of the problem, and summary. So it could be we have a lot of communication problems, we have a lot of med errors, um, we have a long orientation program and we want to decrease that. We, we, maybe I have a lot of simulators and I don't have a plan around it. So you have to identify what is the problem, where is the gap, and then summarize what's going on now. Explain your need for that request for your request. So define what the current state is and why it isn't working. So if there's a gap, and you're going to have to really reach down and say, here's the gap. We've got this. We want to get to this. And here's the gap. So I'm going to need to build a, pro a simulation program to actually help close that gap. And then who are the stakeholders involved? And most likely, it's going to be an interprofessional team. It's going to be administration, it's going to be finance, it's going to be your risk management uh, department. It may be your academic or your service partner, depending on whether you're in a school um, or a hospital. And then you're going to describe the new program. So what is your solution? What do you propose to close this gap? And is the proposal in line with the organization's goals and objectives? I worked with one hospital recently and the CEO went to some conference and was just enamored uh, by simulation. He went back, he bought some simulators, he dedicated space. He really didn't know what he was doing or talking about to the degree that we do, but he knew it was cutting edge and he wanted it to work. So then he hired people to make it happen. You know, that's a great scenario because you have top-down support. Um, but for the most part, we're the ones at the front lines trying to educate the administration as to why we should do this. So we need to make sure that the organization's goals and objectives are in alignment with ours. So most likely, part of their goals and objectives are going to be to enhance quality and patient safety. And so if you can align your business plan for simulation um, along with patient safety and quality, the better you are, and then be able to quantify it. Now, regulations that impact the program, there's uh, the Joint Commission is promoting simulation. In anesthesia, they're pr promoting simulation requirements. Some board certifications are requiring, requiring it. And in schools of nursing, many states have um, a, minima, uh, a maximum percentage of time they can spend in simulation and we need to get to that point. In California we have 25 percent regulation and we would love to go to at least 50 percent. So that's something to think about when the National Council of State Boards of Nursing survey came out, which I'll talk about in a moment, which indicated that uh, 
faculty development is critical, that clinical sites are shrinking, and that simulation is one of the answers to solving that problem because you can do simulation in a controlled environment and guarantee a clinical experience. So to me, that would be a regulation um, and evidence that would um, help build a case for simulation. And that would go along with safety and compliance as well. So one thing that you want to do is a SWOT analysis um, to build your case. And a SWOT, SWOT stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. It guides you to identify the positives and negatives, the inside and outside of the topic, and helps develop full awareness of the situation at hand. It has a long track record of effectiveness, and the strength of the tool lies in that it's very simple and the application to a variety of situations. So it's, it's really good to go armed with a SWOT analysis with your business case as you're talking to your CEO or administrator about why this would be an important um, program to implement. And some of the elements of a SWOT, um, there's internal and external. So the strengths and weaknesses, the SW, are internal. And the OT, opportunities and threats, are on the external side of things. So we need to look at our resources internally. What do we have? We have simulators. We have space. We have people. We have buy-in. What are the weaknesses? Well, we have, there's politics. There's space issues that, that are um, prohibiting us from doing this. Or maybe it's time. Maybe it's money. Um, external opportunities would be that you could become the center of excellence, you could become accredited with accreditation, brings business. Um, other opportunities are for increasing retention, decreasing matters, increasing qualities, etc. And threats may be that uh, down the street there's another sim center. Threats might be that it's not going to be interprofessional and that you're going to have to worry about medicine and nursing and allied health getting together and agreeing on what, what this should look like. So here's an example of a SWOT, and it's usually in four quadrants, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And that's something that you should include in your business case. I'd like to um, propose more than one option when you're building a business case. I like to let my administrator know that if we do nothing and we just maintain the status quo, that something will happen. So, for example, if you're having a high sepsis rate and you continue on this path, you may continue to have high sepsis, increased costs, bad patient outcomes. But your proposed solution to build a simulation program and to focus on sepsis, you could decrease sep sepsis rates, transfer to ICU deaths, which would increase patient outcomes, decrease costs, etc. So if the administrator says, that's a great idea, but why do I need you to do that? I can just, um, why do I need a mannequin? Why do I need educators? Why can't we just you know, watch a movie? Yeah, and or whatever the case may be. So I always like to have a backup plan. So if you're not going to give me a million dollars, then here's five. I'll take five hundred thousand, and with that five hundred thousand, I can only do X, Y, and Z. So we'll make a difference, but we won't make the whole difference that I'm proposing. So I always like to have three options in the business case. Also, the implementation plan, which is. Um, usually the, the timeline, how is it going to be rolled out, how are you going to put it into practice, what is this going to entail, is it going to be doing a train the trainer model, is it going to be taking all your educators and training them or one on each unit um, or one in each program, <clears throat> how are you going to communicate this, how are you going to roll it out, who needs to be involved, what additional resources you'll need, and that's not just financial, it's people. And who's in charge? Are you the one that's actually going to be leading this project? Or are you proposing that someone else does? Or are you proposing that it's a team? Are you proposing that it's the chief medical officer and the nursing educator? Are you proposing it's the program director? Who is in charge? 
And so your timeline and schedule for implementation must include a clear and realistic timeline. So you need to know when your hospital or school is in the budget cycle. Because if budget is needed for this program, and most likely it is, you want to get it in the budget. So find out when the budget cycle is and create a Gantt chart on an Excel um, document or another <clears throat> project management tool that you would find online to map out the timeline and schedule for implementation. And at each point, include a milestone. We'll have X amount of people trained. We'll have the walls up. We'll have the simulators in place. We'll have whatever so that you can follow along um, on the timeline and then be able to celebrate these milestones um, that occur along the way. So a timeline is very important and it needs to coincide with the budget cycle. Then we need, we're going to have to figure out how to evaluate a program. So this is, can be challenging. How are you going to quantify what you've done and evaluate it so that you can show the chief executive officer or your dean that you've made a difference? How are you going to evaluate it? If it's going to be on satisfaction, did the people that went through simulation like it? That would not work for me because we know that people like simulation. Students like to be in simulation. So that wouldn't be one I would use. So you have to identify what data and metrics you will use. Is it then that you'll do X amount of, of simulations, X amount of learners through a given time and then following them into practice to determine whether or not you made a difference. So I talked about sepsis earlier. If you ran 500 nurses through sepsis training, you would need to get baseline data prior to the training. How, how does it look in sepsis? What's happening with transfers to ICU? Take a snapshot of that. Do your training with all your sepsis training with all your nurses and your interprofessional team because it's not always about nursing. And then six months later, take a look at your sepsis rate, your transfers to ICU, and what does that look like? If you can show that because of your training, you've decreased ICU transfers, decreased length of stay, you can quantify that into dollars. It's just one example. So what would it look like for you? Would it be that you're able to, if you're in a school, would it be that you're able to take one clinical day a semester and put it into simulation instead and actually count that as two clinical days because the evidence shows that one hour of simulation is equivalent to at least two hours of clinical. So figure out what, how you would measure success and what does that look like to you. So here's some sample metrics. They would be the for simulation center, maybe the number of simulations that you've completed, number of students, how many courses you've done, what those evaluations look like on those courses. You can look at sepsis rate, transfers, link, de decreasing length of orientation is a big one in a hospital. There's a lot of evidence out there that shows that if you incorporate simulation into your orientation program, that the nurses can get into the clinical environment sooner. And the average that I'm reading recently is about a week or a week sooner into clinical than if they didn't go through simulation. So a week's worth of their time, if you multiply that by the number, number of nurses, is a good chunk of change. So you can quantify the savings that way. Medication errors, if you're seeing a, a, an error, say it's a maybe blood transfusion reaction or another uh, medication, if you focus on simulation and getting people through to train them, setting them up for a medication error, and then you can look and see if that has helped. Code blues, using rapid response. There's all sorts of metrics that you can use. And then lastly, on the business case, you're going to want to have a cost, a cost analysis, a cost-benefit analysis, a cost-effectiveness analysis, and a return on investment. So what is the financial impact? Because you're going to need to build a program which would include simulators, but what type of simulators? They're not all going to be a $90,000 high-fidelity simulator. So how much is 
are the, is the equipment going to cost, the resources, the space, and then when you train people, you're taking them away from clinical into sim, are they being replaced in clinical? If you're in a school, it may just be an incremental cost, but the outcome is going to be that you don't have to fight for those clinical placements and that your students are doing better in school and have a higher confidence rate than they did before. And will this investment yield a savings? So where is the savings going to come? Being able to quantify that. And with the business plan, you should attach a worksheet that has all the complete costs of payroll, FTEs, which is full-time equivalent, and non-payroll for each option. Was a feasibility study completed? Did you actually see if it was warranted to build a program? What does the evidence say? What's going on in the marketplace? What does your SWOT analysis say? And then a pro forma would be, if it, I was the administrator, I would want you to cost it out for me and let me know that with my initial investment of I'll just say a million dollars for simulators and rooms and equipment and beds and staffing and whatnot, after I spend all that money, at what point in the next year, two years, or three years am I going to break even? What my initial investment and what is the return on investment? In, and you need to be able to quantify that. And you may have to have more than one metric that you're looking at to show that number. And that's critical. So I mentioned this, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing Research Study, which is the U.S. National Council of all the state boards of nursing. And they are, they're, I would say, a governing body, but they influence the states because each state has their own uh, rules, regulations, and gover governance. What they did was they took 10 schools from around the country and they implemented 10% of simulation in the first year, 25% in the second, and 50% in the third. And at the end of the, of the survey, or the research study, the outcome showed that there was no difference in NCLEX scores, which is our um, exam that nursing students take to get licensed as a registered nurse. No difference with 50% simulation and 100% clinical experience. This is um, seminal work that is being um, disseminated around the country and is making people really think because with 100% clinical experience, we haven't done a lot of studies on if that's really effective. Because as you know with students, they're not always doing something in the clinical environment. They could be waiting, they could be watching, they could be texting, they could be sitting. In simulation, they cannot hide. We can guarantee a clinical experience. And this study showed that with simulation, one hour would be equal to at least two hours of clinical. So as clinical sites are shrinking, as healthcare reform increases, and a lot of our uh, health care is moving to the continuum of care outside the hospital walls. We need to think beyond our traditional way of educating our nurses, medical students, and allied health. Simulation is one of the answers. And in order to do simulation, faculty development is critical. So is it here to stay, and where is the evidence? Well, this nurse, the NCSBN study really was one that showed no difference in outcomes for students that were trained in simulation versus clinical. Their NCLEX scores were the same. And what they said was unless the facilitator or the faculty or the educator had training, that it wouldn't work. So part of the movement in simulation is really to continuously upgrade faculty and, and implement faculty development programs so that we're all on the same page in a standardized way doing simulation so that it's very safe for the learner and that we're not um, just doing simulation because 
it's the sexy thing to do right now, that we actually have a plan around it, we have objectives, it's tied to curriculum, we have a debriefing plan, and we know how to debrief. We also have lots of studies out there that have showed that sepsis rates have decreased with simulation education, transfers to ICU have decreased, and teamwork has been enhanced. And the big movement is on interprofessional education, specifically around teamwork and collaboration. And the Institute of Medicine report from 1999 to Air is Human said that the number one reason that errors occur is a communication breakdown. We haven't really made a difference since 1999, and I think that stimulation is definitely here to stay because we can actually show positive outcomes. So back to this faculty development notion and budgeting for it. Oftentimes, when we get budget to build a program, we've built a business case, we forget that we have to add in budget for faculty development, ongoing faculty development. Train the trainer model um, is something to consider. Sending people to simulation conferences like IMSH and Inaxel is critical. It enables faculty to sit for national certification, which also increases the credibility of the faculty and your program. Obviously, increases set job satisfaction and retention when you're sending people to classes. And the rapid advances in simulation actually do require ongoing education. So some of the resources for uh, simulation and learning more about it, building a business case, are the Society for Simulation and Healthcare, their annual meeting, which is called the International Meeting on Simulation and Healthcare, is actually this January 18th in San Diego, California. You can look at their website, ssh.org. Uh, they have a peer-reviewed journal as well. International Nursing Society for Clinical Stimulation, little typo there I just saw, and learning, which is called an Anaxel. They have an annual meeting, and that is in June of 2016, this next year in Texas. They also have a peer-reviewed journal. I'm a member of both of these. I'd encourage you all to look into becoming a member of at least one. National League for Nursing is a resource. QSIN, Quality and Safety Education for Nursing. And the California Simulation Alliance, which is um, a great resource uh, alliance that's been around for seven years. So some careers in simulation. I'm going to segue to sort of summarizing um, what some of the careers are and tell you a little bit about our program and then I'm going to open it up for questions and please feel free to go to your chat um, section here um, in the WebEx webinar rather and Jen will help facilitate some of those questions for us. Some careers will be a, a faculty in simulation and we know that not all faculty can be simulation faculty. Um, I tend to focus on those who are early adopters, who are excited about simulation, who want, want to change the way they teach because simulation is so wonderful, rather than those who feel it's a burden. So you can become a faculty, a lead faculty, a director um, in simulation. You could become a simulation technician. There's a huge, huge uh, void of simulation techs in the country right now. There are simulation training programs that are opening up um, around the country. And these techs have various levels. You could be the behind the scenes AV mannequin tech. Um, you could also be a director. If you're in a big organization, you might have five techs working for you as a simulation director. Um, you, these technicians set up rooms for uh, the faculty to run their sims, they turn the rooms over, they can be the voice of the patient, they do all the AV, and it's an up-and-coming field. And historically, we've pulled uh, folks in from the IT area, or maybe a medic, or maybe a nursing student, and we really haven't had formal training around it, so there are formal training programs that are opening up. In our last cohort, of graduates at USF, 
We had two non-clinicians that were in the program. Neither of them had ever worked in simulation. One had, an, had experience in psychology and the other in theater. They're both working now. They both have excellent jobs in simulation centers and they were both hired because they were in this program and they're both hired because they had um, what, it, what it takes to understand the role of the tech, the role of the faculty, the role, the understanding of curriculum development. So we're very proud of them. I'm a coordinator. Uh, depending on the size of the, of the simulation center, you might have a manager, you might have a coordinator, you might have a director. But a coordinator is someone who not only does the coordination, but may um, do some te technology, set up a room, may do some facilitation of debriefing. Depends on, on how big the center is. And then you might have a director that may have some other responsibilities to teaching or they may just, whoops, whoops, where am I? Whoops, I didn't do that. Maybe later, here we go, back to this. I'm so high tech. Um, so <laughs> to a director and then it can become a researcher. There are a lot of people who don't do simulation per se, hands on, but they do research. They watch, they observe, they track, they do studies. So lots of different careers. So here's our program. It's a 30-unit program, which includes 40 hours of, of practicum. It is not a clinical program. It's not a clinical master's. It is an education master's. It's an online program, and it starts in January of 2016. We're graduating our first cohort in December, as I mentioned. We will be having one conference per semester on campus in San Francisco at USF. And because we're on an online program, we can't require it, but it's highly recommended that you come. And if you cannot come in person, we will uh, Zoom you in uh, virtually so that you can participate. And the conference will be a synthesis of what we've learned during the semester. We'll have a few guest speakers. It'll be good to network. We might have um, some simulations being done and some hands-on work. But your practicum hours, that's 540 hours that I described, that, that's really designed for you to go to a sim center in your neighborhood or at your place of employment and get that hands-on experience. So each semester we have different goals and objectives of the practicum. One might be watching the faculty um, write and facilitate a course. One might be on technology. One might be on managing a lab in space. So at the end of, of your 540 hours, you will have a very well-rounded experience in the field, coupled with your 30, well, 20-something units um, of coursework online will prepare you to become professional simulationists, whether you're a physician, a nurse, or a non-clinician. To get into the program, you need to apply and have a bachelor's degree with a 3.0 GPA. Send in your transcripts, three letters of recommendation. You don't have to have experience. For those of you who are non-clinicians, we will require a medical terminology class to be taken within the first month. And we start in January of 16 and are accepting applications through the end of the year. So in summary, I'd like to just say that this webinar is one uh, series of six that we're just sort of wetting your appetite and giving you some highlights of, of different um, components of simulation. And in the master's program, you'll learn about finance, you'll learn about project management, you'll learn about curriculum development, pre-briefing and debriefing, evidence-based practice and research. You'll learn about um, the future of simulation and technology. Where are we going in the future? We have a foundational class that's the first semester to kind of give you an idea of what this is all about. And within um, four semesters, you can be finished or you can take your time and take one class at a time although you may be out of sync and those courses may not be offered every semester, it's up to you how you want to pace yourself. So with that, I think I'm going to open that, open it up to questions. And 
look on the chat and see if anybody has put through a question. Jen, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, I just unmuted. Okay. Any questions come through? I don't see anything yet. All right. Well, we'll just give it a second so that people can locate where their chat is and send us a question. I do have, if you're going to ask a question about scholarships, I do have um, a little um, financial scholarship available for those in need. It's not that much, but it's something that could help. And if you're interested in that, you can let me know and we can work something out. Um, we also have a very strong financial aid department who can help you with different loans, low, low interest loans. And like I said, it's all online starting January 25th is when we're kicking this off. Katie, we have one question or oh, two questions. Um, mm -hmm. this is how does the career outlook vary um, depending on geographic location? And um, uh, one person that is interested in the scholarship information as well. Okay, so we can get, if the person that's interested in the scholarship can just email uh, myself, then I can get you that information. Um, in terms of geography, um, I would say that the urban areas are probably the areas in which you're going to find the most jobs. Some of the areas in the United States that have that do simulation the most, I would say, are the San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles, San Diego. Um, I would say Arizona. I would definitely say Texas. Uh, Louisiana is up and coming. Definitely Miami, big simulation Orlando all the way up the East Coast and um, in Chicago. There are pockets all over the country. Oregon, Washington, very big. Um, if you're in a rural area, uh, you might consider creating your own program in partnership with uh, a bigger organization that um, you know could be 50, 100 miles away, but you could be an annex of that. I think that you need to be open for opportunities as they arise. I'm working with one um, student right now who is living up in um, Oregon. And um, there are several jobs available in California right now. And you just have to make the decision whether you want to want to move or not. Um, Hawaii is very big on simulation for those of you who are looking to over there. <clears throat> but I think that geographically, the urban areas are probably going to be the, your best bet. And I would encourage you to go to the International Meeting on Simulation and Healthcare and um, bring your business cards, your resume, and start networking. Even if you enroll in this program as a student and you approach anyone at that meeting and tell them you're a student, a master's student, you already have one leg up on everybody else that's applying for these jobs. Anything else, Jen? Sorry, yes, we have one more question. Um, have you seen this degree applied to the medical laboratory science profession as well? Medical laboratory science profession. Um, I have not seen, seen that yet, but I would not rule that out at all. Um, we, we, have a, we have a physician that's graduating in December. Um, we have been trained talking to a lot of PTs and OTs, but med medical science lab, not at this point. But I think it would be a great segue. I, I think that um, it's not a clinical degree, so um, I think that from the clinician's perspective, they there's a lot of learning that has to be done regarding curriculum development and educational principles and finance and that. Uh, the clinical part is the easy, easy part for the clinicians, but we don't really highlight that. 
Um, I would say that that would be a good opportunity, but I haven't seen it yet. And I noticed that we might have a couple of people that are out of the country on the call just by their email. Um, you can uh, take this all online and then we would have to most likely get a memorandum of understanding from a sim lab in whatever country you're in. We currently have a relationship with Australia, <laughs> if anybody's on the phone from Australia. Um, but it doesn't mean we can't get any from any other country. It just takes us a little time to get that paperwork done and we want, you know, we ask for your help as well in securing those sites. Anybody else? No real questions. All right, everybody. Well, you're probably going to be getting a, a follow-up email from our recruiter. And uh, so look for that. Her name's Tamara White. And please uh, contact me if you have any further questions. And hopefully we can see you on our next webinar in December. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you again.